20, from 20, verse 20. Keeping a close watch on Jesus, they sent spies. This is the Jewish leaders sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius whose image and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. A great answer. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Let's pray for a moment, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word We thank you for the wisdom of Jesus that we uh, read there uh, in his words uh, as he's challenged uh, concerning uh, truth and allegiance and love. And Lord, we pray that as we uh, have read that uh, word, Lord, as we reflect on it now, you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit, that you would speak through your word uh, to our hearts. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I want to uh, begin by taking you back to the late 80s, early 90s. It was a time of great turmoil for the world in which we live because 89 was the, the fall of the Iron Curtain and lots of changes in Eastern Europe and the breakup of the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, back in uh, Blighty, uh, we were bothered about a thing called the poll tax. And the poll tax was introduced in, in 1989, and the poll tax was officially called the community charge uh, and was essentially a, a, a tax per head. Every adult had to pay the tax. There were, I think, some reductions for the poorest uh, people, but uh, people got really exercised about this poll tax. Uh, it was introduced first in 1989 in Scotland. We got it first, uh, and the expression that uh, was coined at that time was uh, "can't pay, won't pay," uh, and that was what uh, people would say. Uh, it it uh, was kind of widened out to England, and Wales the following year, uh, and this led to the poll tax. Uh, riots. There we have a picture from Scotland down bottom left. You can tell by the bagpipes. And top right uh, down in London. And uh, there was something like uh, 100 people uh, were injured in these riots. There was over 300 uh, arrested. Uh, so there was a big rammy. Uh, and towards the end of 1990, this was probably one of the major factors that led to the departure uh, from the position of Prime Minister of Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, The poll tax itself didn't last an awful lot longer. The new Prime Minister, Mr. Major, and his government decided to get rid of it, and by 1993 it had been replaced by the council tax, which is what we have still today. So that's taking you back in time. Some of the younger folks here might not even remember such a thing and the excitement that it caused. Now, the reason for mentioning the poll tax or the community charge is that that was what was being discussed uh, by the people who came to challenge and question Jesus that day. They came to talk about a poll tax. Probably wasn't quite as much, but for many of the poor people at the time, it would have still been expensive. And maybe they would 
have felt, well, I can't pay, so I'm not going to pay. But the consequences probably in those days would have been an awful lot worse. Uh, I've got a picture coming up uh, of the coin. This was most likely uh, an example of the coin that would have been used. This is a Tiberian denarius, uh, because the emperor at that time was Tiberius, and this was his coin, uh, equivalent to about three pounds uh, today, but given that we're having a little bit of devaluation of the pound right now, maybe it's more like close to two pounds. So it's, it's the equivalent of about two pound coin today was the, the head tax, the poll tax, that was applied to everyone uh, in that nation at that time, and probably indeed to the whole empire. Uh, the coin is inter interesting. It has the portrait on one side of the emperor, Tiberius, uh, and it's got an inscription which is abbreviated and in Latin, but uh, being a Latin scholar not, I gave it up in second year because I hated Latin, uh, but says something along these lines. Caesar Augustus Tiberius, which was his full title, son of the divine Augustus. So his dad was considered to be a god and Tiberius was considered to be a god as well. Uh, on the other side, this is kind of quite nice and cozy, there's a picture of his mother, uh, whose name was Livia, Augustus' wife. Uh, and she's pictured there, go back a little bit, uh, She's holding a, a spear in one hand and an olive leaf or twig in the other, maybe picturing war and peace or something of that nature. Uh, and again, there's another Latin inscription, this time Pontiff Maxim, which means high priest, because in the pagan religion of the Romans, uh, not only was the Caesar one of the gods, he was also the high priest of their religion. And so this is the coin that would have been passed to Jesus that day. And it was essentially a, a portable idol promoting paganism. Uh, I'm not sure Jesus would be that fussed about it uh, as is apparent in what he says in a moment. Uh, and the Jewish leaders, they wouldn't have been too fussed about this head tax either, or indeed this little coin, claiming that Caesar was the high priest, because that's certainly not what they consider to be the case. Uh, and they sent some people, some spies, to test Jesus with uh, their Tiberian denarius. And they begin quite positively, uh, trying to lull him into a false sense of security, uh, and they make some very positive statements. They say that you're somebody who teaches the truth, which was true of Jesus. Uh, and you're somebody who, ha who shows no partiality towards one group of people as opposed to another uh, group of people, uh, which was true. Uh, Jesus uh, didn't consider one group of people greater or better than any other group of people. He treated people uh, equally. And so these were true statements. But then they came in with their, <clears throat> their, their test, uh, to test Jesus, this question that they ask. You know, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Uh, and they're really kind of putting at odds uh, the Roman system and the Roman high priest, which was Caesar, uh, against uh, the Jewish system, the Jewish high priest, who I presume at that point was Caiaphas. Yeah, so which of these two are you going to support? And of course, whichever answer Jesus gave could cause him difficulties. If he said, pay, support Caesar, then that would upset the people. Uh, if uh, he said, well, no, don't pay, because he wanted to support the Jewish system, then that might upset uh, the Romans. So it was a kind of no-win situation for uh, Jesus in that context. So what does Jesus do? Uh, he doesn't say pay. He doesn't say don't pay. He doesn't even say can't pay, won't pay. 
Uh, Instead, as Jesus tends to do in most of these situations, is he comes back with another question, which is this. Whose portrait and inscription are on it? And of course, they then respond. Uh, They're obviously looking at one side of it. They respond, well, Caesar's. Tiberius Caesar is on there. That's his picture. They could have said, and his mum on the other side. But really, it was Tiberius that, that was the key picture. And Jesus then comes back with this very wise uh, statement. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Uh, and no one had any answer to that. It was a very profound but true statement. And I think what we need to uh, be clear about when we read a statement like that is that Jesus wasn't in any sense suggesting that there was a, or establishing some sort of sacred secular divide. That there are things in this world that, that are entirely God's and then there's other things in this world that are entirely Caesar's. Other than really this coin that was in his hand, that Uh, that day. Because Jesus' understanding would be, well, really just about everything in this world is God's. Everything that is good in this world is God's. Uh, And really, the only things that are are Caesar's are are things that are bad. Uh, If you go and look at uh, Psalm 24, for example, uh, the first two verses, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So it's not like Jesus is saying, well, everything in heaven is God's and everything on earth is Caesar's because he's the emperor of this large empire. No, Jesus' understanding is like virtually everything in this world is God's. Uh, And Caesar really is only responsible for a few not so very good things, including this uh, Tiberian denarius. So there's no secular sacred divide here. If you go back a couple of uh, chapters to Luke 18, you remember we looked at the story of the rich young ruler. And he was somebody who had a whole stack of these Tiberian denarii. Uh, He maybe had hundreds of them, thousands of them. And, you know, Jesus called him to follow him, but he refused to get rid of even one of these Tiberian denarius, denarii, not very good on the plurals and singulars. And so really what Jesus is saying is, well, we need to keep what is good in our lives, what is godly in our lives, and, and dispose of anything else, anything that's bad, anything that really would be counted as Caesar's. Um, And we need God's Holy Spirit to guide and direct us in that. Here's a a nice little picture. Uh, The kingdom of God is seen as a tiny little uh, door through which we go, through which we can't take stuff. Um, The stuff, I suppose, is Caesar's stuff. Uh, But of course, you know, that picture is uh, not accurate in the sense that the kingdom of God is something very large and big. But uh, we want to let go of the stuff in the sack that is Caesar's, because we can't take it into God's kingdom. Uh, When our uh, children were at secondary school, and uh, some of you, well, there are some Beauclair pupils here, at least Alex is a Beauclair pupil. Do you still have the the, the money in your thumb for the canteen? Does that still operate? Yes, yes, he's holding up his thumb, which is full of money. And uh, the canteen there, I don't know if this works at other secondary schools locally, but your money is on your thumb. And when you go to the canteen, there's a little machine there. You could, uh, you you stuck your thumb on the machine. You could uh, put money onto your account and it would go onto your thumb. Uh, And then when you went into the canteen and paid for your your food, your lunch, uh, you would stick your thumb in the appropriate place and the money would be deducted from your thumb. Uh, It seems a kind of bizarre way of doing it, but it it seemed to work. 
the idea was, you know, you can, can steal money off somebody and, and use their money to buy your lunch. Uh, although I think there were maybe stories of, of poor little first years getting dragged to the machine and their thumb being stuck on it and their money being removed forcibly. So it didn't work perfectly. Um, now, of course, once they left school, they might still have some money on their thumb. But it was of absolutely no value any longer because they were no longer in that world where the money on their thumb was of some value or use to them. And, and really the Tiberian denarii or denarius is like that money that the kids had uh, at school on their thumb. You know, when you were in that context, it was worth something. You could buy your lunch. But once you were out of that context, it had no value what. So, ever. so what are the things that we have in our sack that we should be getting rid of? Well, I suppose it does include stuff, and we all like stuff, and we can buy stuff with our uh, denarii or our pounds. Uh, and so maybe there's some stuff we need to be getting rid of. Uh, maybe some of us are a little bit too addicted to some of our stuff and, and we need to abandon those addictions uh, that draw us to kind of spend lots of our hard-earned money on stuff and more stuff. It could be that our inner attitudes that we need to uh, be dealing with because we have Caesar-like attitudes that we need to get rid of and, and these are often be based on lies. Things like, well, God is not really a good God. That actually there are other places where we can find good things other than him. Or maybe lies about ourselves, that we're not really worth a, an awful lot. That, that God really doesn't love us in the way that the Bible says. Maybe lies about other, about other people that we're clinging on to, that, that stop us embracing them, stop us forgiving them, uh, stop us showing grace towards them. It could be lies about our circumstances, thinking that, the, that they're a lot worse than they really are, because when God's involved, uh, you know, we can survive our circumstances, we can get through our circumstances, we can uh, grow above our circumstances. It could be broken things uh, in our lives because stuff breaks. It could be broken lives. It could be broken relationships. It could be broken bodies. It could be broken homes. Uh, these are all in, in Caesar's territory, and God wants to uh, come in and transform these things. We're not quite on to the next slide yet. <laughs> Alex, thank you. Uh, and so... You know, the, there are things to be fixed. And sometimes we think that we can fix these things uh, using uh, solutions that Caesar has provided. We can fix these things with money. Uh, when we were talking about money in, in the series on the blessed life, uh, came out, we shared that principle that if something can be fixed with money, then it's not a problem. If you have a problem, then that's something you should take to God because he's the one who can fix those things. The idea that uh, any of Caesar's stuff or Caesar's money can fix our deepest problems is just another lie. We need to find uh, help in God. Okay, Alex, the next uh, picture. Uh, you could have a think about who that might be uh, being crowned. Uh, but all of this happened that day with Jesus in the context of the Roman Empire. Uh, and it was like the massive empire that was uh, in place at that time, covering the, the known world. Uh, we even sit here on a, what was a Roman fort many years ago uh, at one of the boundaries of, of the Roman Empire. Uh, and a bit like maybe the Soviet Union in 1989, we maybe thought that it would never fail, never fall. The Soviet Empire did, and, and the Roman Empire did. It fell. They tried all sorts of solutions along the way. Uh, Caesar, the Caesars, looked for solutions to the problems that they had. 
But ultimately, uh, the Roman Empire fell. It had various incarnations. I think around about 285, it was, it was divided into two bits, with a capital in Rome and a capital in Constantinople, which is now uh, Istanbul. Uh, the western side was attacked and overthrown by uh, a group of people that would be generically called barbarians. Uh, they had all sorts of different names and titles. Uh, and that was around about uh, 400 or so AD. The western part of the empire collapsed. And that was even though they had... Uh, made the empire Christian around about 300 AD, uh, but they did it in a Caesar-like way, and in an institutional-like way. They forced people to become Christians. They forced them to be baptized, like the whole empire was intended to be Christian. But in actual fact, it wasn't really Christianity as we understand it from the Bible. So the Western Empire fell in 476. Uh, the East based on Constantinople, lasted for another thousand years till the 1400s. And yet, in the end of the day, it too fell. Uh, there was one further incarnation of the Roman Empire, uh, which is what's pictured here. Does anybody know who that might be? Being crowned? Charlemagne. This is why you always want Graham in your quiz team. This is 800. It's Rome. It is the crowning of Charlemagne by the Pope as the first of the Holy Roman Emperor, em, Emperors. Uh, and the Holy Roman Empire, which uh, covered Central Europe, lasted from 800 AD to 1806, so relatively recent. But ultimately, the Roman Empire fell because they, uh, the, their solutions were always Caesar-directed solutions. And ultimately, the Caesars were only men. Maybe if they'd appointed a woman, it would have all been different, but no, they were all men, and uh, their solutions ultimately failed. And, you know, the truth is that even today, uh, modern-day politicians and leaders you know, pursue Caesar-type solutions to the problems that we face in our world. And uh, I would suggest, not wanting to be too political, but like the whole Brexit thing is looking a bit like that. You know, it's Caesar solutions and there's just frustration and failure beckoning uh, on that front. Because that's not really where we ought to be according to Jesus. Because... Uh, the solution, the, this idea of giving to God what is God's and, and ditching Caesar's stuff is found in the wandering rabbi who they were uh, questioning that day. The solution is found in Jesus. Next slide, please, Alex. Thanks. Because, of course, you know, we know from Scripture that the, the, the true high priest, the great high priest, is not Caesar, it's not Caiaphas, it's Jesus. And he is the one that brings uh, the God's solutions to bear. He is the true and great pontiff maxim, not this little coin and not the Jewish high priest either. Uh, and he encourages us to embrace the truth, the things that he taught when he was here, the things that he spoke, the things that are written for us in the scriptures. Uh, truths like, you know, God is good and God has the very best for all of us and for this world that we uh, live in. God is good. That Jesus' blood has paid for everything. Now that's where we should go for the solutions to the problems we face. The cross. That each one of us is, is valuable in God's sight. He loves us. He loves the whole world. He wants to have a relationship with us. And anything is possible in this world when God is on your side and when you're pursuing God's will for your life. And so we need to embrace 
the truth, the truth of the great high priest that is Jesus. This is a particular picture that uh, the writer to the Hebrews develops right throughout the book of Hebrews. Talks about Jesus as a great high priest who has gone through the heavens. Uh, A high priest in the order of Melchizedek. A high priest who has sat down at the right hand of God. A great high priest tempted in every way as we are but yet without sin. A high priest who meets our needs. A high priest of the good things that are already here. So as we, as we close, I just want you to think about, you know, what are the things of Caesar's that we still cling onto? Because I'm sure every single one of us will have things of Caesar's that we cling onto, not just that two-pound coin in, in our pocket. Because these things don't ultimately do us any good. They hold us back They bring out his likeness in us so that we kind of look like that Tiberian denarius. But instead, what of God is in us? On the next slide, I've got kind of a a coin. I'm not quite sure where that came from, but it is, it's a, a picture, an inscription representing Jesus. So whose portrait and inscription do we bear? Is it the portrait of inscription of Caesar? Are we still clinging on to some of his stuff? Or is it the portrait and inscription of Jesus? Uh, There is that uh, text where it talks as being changed from one degree of glory to another as we take on the image of Jesus in our lives. We should give thanks for the good things that we have in our life that come from him. We should cultivate things, these things. We should water these things. We should allow the Holy Spirit to bring that portrait and inscription of Jesus more evidently into our lives. So when we're here in the church or when we're out there in the world, when we're meeting people Uh, in our job or where we're studying or in our neighborhood, what is it that they see? Do they look at us and see, like them, the portrait and scripture of Caesar? Or do they instead see the portrait and inscription of Jesus, our Savior and Lord? Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we Thank you for Jesus' wise words, Uh, Lord, that we should give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, the things that uh, stop us being who you want us to be, the things that are tripping us up and troubling us. Let's just give them back to Caesar. Uh, Lord, identify these things in our hearts and lives and, uh, and give us the courage to let them go. Sometimes we gain a degree of false comfort from these things, uh, Lord, but ultimately they just cause us harm. And so help us to identify these things and just let them go. And instead, Lord, help us to embrace the truth that is in Jesus, the truth that is in your word, the truth that's brought to us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we be transformed by you, even this morning, changed into the likeness of Jesus, changed from one degree, degree of glory to another. Lord, may we be people as we go out from here today, over this coming week, that when people see us, they see Jesus' image displayed in our lives. And we ask that in his name. Amen.